Barbara. His work involves understanding psychotherapy from empirical, historical, and anthropological perspectives, which has led to the development of a contextual model of psychotherapy. His work is summarized in the book The Great Psychotherapy Debate, The Evidence for What Makes Psych Psychotherapy Work. He is also a fellow of the American Psychological Association and a diplomat in counseling psychology of the American Board of Professional Psychology. In 2007, he received a distinguished professional contribution to Applied Research Award from the American Psychological Association, and he is also an honorary doctor in the social sciences at Stockholm University. So that's quite a mouthful. Very happy to have you here, Bruce, again, before you fly back to, uh, to Wisconsin. I would say the floor is yours, and then afterwards we're going to have a great debate, of course. So in 40 minutes, I'm going to tell you um, how psychotherapy works and everything I know. So I'm going to go really quickly. I'm retired from being a professor, so I miss having an audience you know, that has to listen to me. So thank you for coming on this Saturday morning. So uh, let's get started, because I'm going to go fast. Uh, I'm going to start right here, because you know, this is quite amazing what we do as psychotherapists. We sit in a room for usually about 50 minutes, once a week, and we change people's lives. How is that even possible? So think about it. Well, I'm going to start uh, very quickly by talking about healing in a social context. Um, ants do this. So if there's an ant sick in a colony of ants, what do you think the colony does? Well, it's really pretty baffling to the scientists because what happens is each ant in the colony comes up to the healthy ant and gets in close proximity. It's social grooming, but, but touching the sick ant. Why would they do that? Well, it transfers a little bit of the pathogen from the sick ant to the healthy ant, and then the healthy ant has an immune reaction, and they call it a social vaccination. Okay? Bees, when there's a sick bee or an infection, they flap their wings really frenetically in the hive, raises the temperature of the hive, and that's a social fever. So every, we know that a, a higher body temperature fights infection. So here are social animals um, uh, healing by social means. So we've evolved to do this. Well, it was kind of a, a contraindicated behavior to rub up against the sick ant in COVID times, right? You don't want to go rub up against a a uh, uh, COVID-infected person. So I looked for uh, natural quarantine, and vampire bats naturally quarantine. So when some, one of the bats has an infection, they tend to be isolated, particularly from non-kin other bats. So we have the social healing. Let's look at humans. How do we actually signal that we need help, social help? to heal. Ah, when you're hurt, you have a facial expression. It's cross-cultural. It evolved about 10,000 years ago. It's a way of signaling that you need help. So, and it turns out there's so, social healing practices in every civilization um, from the beginning of, of human civilization. Very different, right? Uh, indigenous Americans, ancient Greeks had very different healing practices. But there was a designated healer, like us, right? We're a designated psychologist or psychotherapist, okay? And healing practices, what do we do? Well, if you think about it, here's what we do. We sit in a room and talk to people. That's the healing practice. 
So we've evolved uh, to have this large brain. Large brains are very expensive uh, in terms of calories. Most of our calories that we eat go to fuel our brain. Evolutionary, not a good idea to have this calorie consuming organism. But it evolved to manage social relationships. So here, study the larger the social relationship of the primates, the larger the brain has to be. So this is what our brain is evolved for. And a couple books that really are interesting that talk about this is The Neuroscience of Sociality and then Social Contagion, because much of uh, behavior, attitudes, cognitions actually propagate through social um, uh, in, uh, groups in the same way diseases do. So this is the social basis. So what do we know about psychotherapy? It works. It's been demonstrated in randomized clinical trials as well as practicing psychotherapists uh, produce um, strong outcomes. It's effective as medications for mental disorders, particularly anxiety and depression, um, but it's longer lasting, okay? Once you terminate psychotherapy, you actually learn something and it persists as opposed to medication where your relapse are high, fewer side effects, less resist resistant to additional courses. But the NNT is three. Remember, I like numbers because I was trained in mathematics. This means that um, uh, it's the number needed to treat. So three people have to receive psychotherapy in order to have one better outcome than would have been without psychotherapy. That means we help about one person out of three. I go, that's a little depressing, right? I can see it on your faces. That means we don't succeed. But if you look at the NNT for most medical practice, cardiology, respiratory diseases, the NNTs are in the teens and even up to the hundreds for standard medical practices that you might receive. Okay. So the question is, what makes psychotherapy work? And I'm going to do this quite quickly. But the point I want to make before we get started on this is that it doesn't work. Psychotherapy does not work in just one way. You have to keep different aspects of what we're doing in mind simultaneously. So I'm going to talk about three pathways to healing. And I'm going to talk first about the care pathway. This is the, the caring, attentive, real, empathic relationship with a a uh, healer, okay? And we talk about many different kinds of relationship variables, um, but we're gonna see these multiple ways of talking about the relationship really boil down to uh, two essentials. So how is this warm, caring, understanding relationship Therapeutic. By the way, we're talking about psychotherapy. This is also true of medicine. So if you look at uh, physicians' practice, the same three pathways are there. Okay. So you know all these things are not good for you, right? Lack of exercise, smoking particularly. What is more dangerous, and actually in terms of mortality, greater risk for death, than smoking, excessive drinking, lack of exercise. Yeah. Loneliness. And many people that come to psychotherapy are lonely because of their disorder or because of the social reaction to their disorder, right? Many people become isolated. So one thing that psychotherapy does is provides a human connection with somebody who's caring and understanding. We shouldn't underestimate uh, the importance of this. Reduces loneliness. You know, psychotherapy is uniquely enduring. Something quite amazing. So 
when I was teaching, I would always, when I got to this part in the class, ask, who has a relationship like this? And I just remember this one instance. A student raised his hand, said, I have a relationship like that. Well, tell us about it. I can tell my wife anything, and she'll be there for me. I go, okay, yeah, you already know what's going to happen. Thought experiment. You go home, tell your wife you just had a, or you've been having an affair with one of the other students for three years, and come back next week and tell us about the enduring relationship. Psychotherapy, you can tell your therapist. There's some exceptions in different places. Uh, um, harm to yourself or others. But the contract is that I'll be here for you next week. And not just here, here in an empathic, understanding way. That's unique. It also results in emo emotional regulation. We make a big deal in, the, in mental health about uh, emotional regulation as being the key to many disorders, either overregulated or underregulated. Well, it turns out there's good research that we don't regulate our emotion individually. We do it in social context. So, and this is called uh, emotional co-regulation, and there's a uh, Time, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but two people who are close, intimate, uh, uh, connected, actually their uh, emotion co-regulates. So I help my intimate partner regulate emotion unconsciously. This is not an a, a intentional intervention. It occurs outside of awareness. So it occurs when there's mutual trust. It'd be fun to talk about this in a little more detail. So some researchers actually looked at this. They've, uh, various means, assessed emotion, and they see that in psychotherapy, the patient's emotion mirrors that of the therapist. So it's a way to help co-regulate. So lots of evidence for relationship variables, this idea that we're reducing loneliness, we're providing a close, intimate relationship. And if you look at the evidence for this, it's relatively strong. These are effect sizes from meta-analyses in, in John's book on psychotherapy relationships that work. Um, I probably should say Norcross because he's a friend of mine, so I call him John. But if you want to look it up, John Norcross. Uh, empathy, congruence, real relationship, alliance, and so forth. All strong predictors of the outcome. Okay, let's talk now about the expectancy pathway. So which of you know this is dangerous, right? Yeah, yeah, we all know that. But now think for a second how you learned about this. How did you learn not to stick a metal object in an electrical receptacle? Okay, well, classical conditioning. Ivan Pavlov got a Nobel Prize for this, right? So you stuck the metal object in there, you're shocked, and that's associative learning or classical conditioning. How many learned that way? I'm going to get you involved. One. There's always one. Yeah. So uh, Albert Bandura, famous American psychologist, talked about vicarious learning. How many uh, watched a sibling or a friend do this and learned that way? Yeah, one. Good. Thank you. There's always one. Uh, maybe we've evolved to avoid this because, you know, we have a module in our brain that makes us afraid of spiders and snakes and scary stuff, right? That's evolved. Well, we haven't had time. How did the rest of us learn to do this? Yeah. Verbal persuasion from a trusted other. Just the fact we were told this was dangerous from somebody who we trusted. 
And if I could boil down in one sentence what we do as psychotherapists, it's this. We're a trusted person in this patient's life and we help them do something that's healthy instead of the unhealthy things they're doing currently. And the fact that we're trusted makes that um, dictate so powerful. Okay. Now, we do very different things, right? Uh, if you're a cognitive behavior therapist, you help people think about the world in a more appropriate way or a more functional way. If we're a psychodynamic therapist, to be able to experience and tolerate difficult emotions. These are healthy things. And we persuade people to do it and create the expectancy that this will lead to uh, reduced distress and greater satisfaction. Okay. So we know expectations have a strong influence on well-being. They're created through this verbal persuasion, most likely. And this leads us to placebo effects, that we can feel better just from the expectation. So we're going to talk about placebos for a minute. But first, the humorous part of the presentation. Nothing works better. Yeah. It's a joke, right? Nothing works better. Yeah, okay. Has to be um, uh, told in the right way, I guess. So placebos work for a variety of disorders, um, even Parkinson's disease, right? A very uh, uh, clear disease state. Um, but so let's talk about placebos just very quickly. We know for pain, which is the most often studied uh, model for placebos, um, if you give someone experiencing pain a placebo, they will re report less pain. But what's interesting is the brain also releases endogenous opioids. So it isn't just a kind of epiphenomenon where we we report that we feel less pain. We actually have physiological processes. Um, if you're aware that you're getting morphine after surgery, it's more effective than if you're not aware. Okay, ben, uh, Fabrizio Benedetti in Italy studies fascinating. Okay, so uh, we'll go through this quickly, but uh, studies by Alia Crum. Uh, as people drink these milkshakes, uh, they're presented as either indulgent, very fattening, full of calories, or sensible milkshakes. Of course, everybody gets the uh, uh, kind of moderate calorie drink, 380 calories. But if you got the indulgent, told you this is really fattening, you felt more full after you ate it. But what's interesting is, you also had a greater decline in ghrelin, the hunger hormone. So again, it isn't just a phenomenon of uh, your sensation, but there's all a um, documented physiological reaction as well. OK, I think I'll skip this one. We'll come back to Aaliyah Crumbs. Mental disorders are particularly uh, um, reactive to placebos. So here's uh, chamomile extract for anxiety. Okay, Effective even when it's a placebo. For depression, we know from Irving Kirsch's work and other works, about 95% of the effect of antidepressant medication is due to placebo. Okay, So this pill will make you feel less depressed, has a reaction, a strong reaction. And you know, antidepressant medications were the most profitable drug ever sold in the world. Billions of dollars of profit uh, from what essentially is a placebo. So if you think about expectations, the alliance really is much about the acceptance of the treatment as effective. So these variables related to expectancy 
um, have a strong effect. So this is the expectancy pathway. But the, the caring and the expectancy pathways um, work together to uh, create the effects of psychotherapy. So a couple studies very, very quickly. Irritable bowel syndrome, a prevalent disorder in primary care, and it's responsive to placebos. Okay. Um, and here the, the placebo is an acupuncture placebo. The, the needle doesn't actually pierce the skin. You get a sensation of it being piercing, but it doesn't pierce the skin, so technically it's a, it's a placebo. But it was three conditions. One is you didn't get any placebo, so you went to your primary care doctor and treatment as usual. The second one, you got acupuncture, two sessions. The acupuncturist said, I'm an expert in this, delivered the acupuncture, and off, off you go. In the augmented condition, it was a warm, caring acupuncture, spent some time, uh, called you by your name, asked how you're doing, no advice, just warm, caring. And if you look at the results, the augmented, warm, caring placebo worked better than the placebo, which worked better than treatment as usual. So here's expectancy effect augmented by warm, caring relationship. Same thing in lower back pain, get some kind of a electrical stimulation, and whether it's a placebo or the real treatment given by a warm, caring uh, physiotherapist, uh, more effective. Okay, I think we have time for this one because this one's really important. This is Aaliyah Crum again. And she has this great experiment where she wants to look at warmth and caring by a physician. So she recruited Stanford undergraduates where she's a professor and told them they're going to be in this medical study. But before they can be in their medical study, they have to pass a physical. Okay, And really, there is no other study. The physical is the study. So what she's going to do is, it, during the course of the physical examination, the doctor does an allergy test, pricks the arm with a histamine, everybody has a reaction to it, and she, uh, the doctor then says, well, you've had an allergic reaction, uh, you can't be in the study, so you're disqualified. But I have some cream to put on that to make the wheel, the redness, uh, go away. Well, this is a placebo cream. Okay. Now the doctor in this example is going to be either competent or not and warm or not. Okay. So high warmth physician asked the patient's name, made eye contact, uh, sat close, warm posters on the wall. In the low warmth, just the opposite. So here you have a warm, caring physician and one who's very Matter of fact, competence, clear, confident tone, didn't make any mistakes in the procedure, uh, room was well organized. In the low competence, well, physician, I'm going to do the uh, uh, blood pressure. No, I'm going to listen to your uh, respiratory first. So kind of disfluent. Okay, uh, made mistakes in procedures, put on the blood pressure cuff incorrectly, had to do it a second time. Uh, messy desk, stethoscope was under, and under some papers and so forth. And all of this to see what effect it had on a placebo. And it turns out if you had a warm, caring, competent physician, well, perceived to be competent physician, the placebo worked better. Okay, again, the two dimensions of warmth and caring, as well as competence. So, Analia called this when the doctor gets it, what's, what your condition is, that's the competence, and gets you understanding and caring. Okay, so it turns out warmth and competence are universal dimensions of social cognitions. This is 
the assessment we make of people. Are they allies or not? That's the warmth, caring, do they care about me? And are they actually competent at what they're doing? So, and it turns out we've looked at the relationship variables that I talked about, and if you factor analyze them, they all come down to two factors. Confidence in the therapist, so somebody who cares for me, and comp uh, confidence in the treatment that I'm gonna get. Okay, so a relationship isn't sufficient. The, the, the confidence in what we're doing in therapy is important. Okay, let's talk about the last pathway, the specific effects. We do something. Okay, you go to a doctor, you get an antibiotic. The antibiotic is the specific treatment. We know that antibiotics and proton pump inhibitors, for instance, are a successful and specific way to treat gastric ulcer. If you have an appendicitis, you want an appendectomy. Um, if you're worried about COVID, you get a vaccination, a messenger RNA designed vaccination, specific effects. Well, in psychotherapy, we have exposure for anxiety, let's say cognitive restructuring for depression. Empty chair work if you're an emotion focused or gestalt therapist. So we have specific effects. But it turns out in psychotherapy, there really are no differences among the treatments. So the particular specific effect doesn't make it a difference. And we won't go through the research on this, but it's true for anxiety, depression, PTSD, uh, childhood disorders, interestingly including externalizing disorders, which I was surprised about because I thought behavioral treatments would be more successful. Eating disorders, variety of treatments. Alcohol and substance use disorders. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder may be an exception. Okay, we won't spend too much time on this. Naturalistic settings, exactly the same. Data from the National Health Service in Great Britain showed CBT, psychodynamic, uh, person-centered therapies all had similar outcomes. In the latest studies of depression in the, in the uh, um, what do they call it in England, it's the increased access to psychological treatments, IAPT. In the IAP program, um, CBT is, is uh, equal to the effects of generic counseling although generic counseling, slightly shorter treatments, and many others. So, how much time do I have, Alex? Can I go into another five minutes? Well, uh, no, you have, let's see, 15 minutes. 15, oh, perfect. I'll talk a little slower. <laughs> I told you, I just want to tell you everything I know about this. Let's talk about an important uh, aspect of this. And this is the therapist. Therapists are kind of the forgotten factor. I remember going to this large conference of thousands of people in Norway, and, and Peter Fonagy was there as the keynote speaker. And then at the end of the conference, I had this debate with Peter Fonagy. And I just said, I've been sitting through two days of lectures about psychotherapy. And not once have people talked about the importance of the person that gives the therapy. There were discussions of disorders, there were discussions, treatments for disorders, arguments about what's the best treatment, but no one talked about the therapist. Okay. And the definition of a therapist effect is some therapists consistently get better outcomes than other therapists. Okay. We'll see if that's true. This is true regardless of the type of patients. We know some patients are going to have poor prognosis, right? Comorbidity with personality disorders is a prognostic uh, factor for uh, less success. Not due to chance, so luck factors. We know there's some luck, right? We're treating a social phobic male who finds a, a intimate woman partner and the social anxiety, no, it's nothing I did, it's luck, 
Okay. So let's look at the evidence for therapist factors. In naturalistic settings, uh, about 7% of the variability in outcome is due to the particular therapist. Doesn't sound like a lot, but I'm going to show you it is. In clinical trials where the therapists are selected for their expertise, right, they're all expert therapists, they get particular training in the treatments being studied, they're supervised, often one hour of supervision for one hour of um, uh, uh, therapy. So perfect conditions for the therapist to succeed and still 3% of the variability in outcome is due to the therapist. Here's a graph, again, from the National Health Service in England, uh, Michael Barkham and, and colleagues. And the green therapists are uh, um, consistently and reliably above average. Okay, so you see the average line. Uncertainty, because, you know, if you measure therapist outcomes, there's going to be variability because some Patients are more difficult to treat than others and so forth and these factors of luck. So there's, there's a confidence intervals are pretty wide, but clearly the green therapist uh, uh, above average and the red therapist below average. So if you look at the ver uh, uh, effect sizes for therapists, they're relatively large, much larger than the differences between treatments. So we spend... I don't know if you do this, but around the world we argue about which treatment is the best treatment for which disorder, and my treatment is just as effective as your treatment. And we forget more variability is due to the therapist giving those treatments. Okay, so there are really skilled, effective cognitive behavioral therapists, and there's some that are pretty much in the red zone. And it turns out the longer therapy goes on, the bigger the differences get. So by the 15th session in this state in the National Health Service, the poor therapists have a zero chance of helping a patient recover. Whereas the more effective therapist, as therapy progresses, the probability of, of recovery actually increases. So I put this graph in there because I think this is just so illustrative of how important the therapist is. So this leads us to the important question, right? What are the characteristics and actions of effective therapists? Okay. Again, that's supposed to be a funny cartoon, so if you want to kind of go, yeah, that's funny. Uh, if you go to the Handbook of Psychotherapy and Behavior Change, which is kind of the Bible of psychotherapy research, if you go to the 2004 edition, uh, Larry Butler reviews the evidence, and his conclusion, paraphrased, is we don't know, can't identify what are the characteristics or actions of effective therapists. And we really don't care because there's very little research on therapists, okay? Tens of thousands of clinical trials on psychotherapy. Um, I don't know of more than two or three that actually in the initial data looked at therapist effects, so. Uh, Jesse Owen and, and I, in the latest edition of the handbook, review therapist effects and what makes an effective therapist. So we'll talk for the remainder of the time on who are the effective therapists. Okay. So how would you identify them? Well, you could observe therapy, but we know there's luck involved, there's uh, prognostic factors, all kinds of things that make it difficult. There's research to indicate that a therapist will look relatively incompetent with an interpersonally challenging uh, patient. So observing therapy um, is not really a reliable way to do this. And I'm going to have you do a little experiment to show you that in a minute. 
even if you did observe, what would you observe? Okay, and here probably experts from different uh, approaches would observe different things. So it's difficult. Well, if we're going to identify uh, uh, who's the effective therapist, I suggest we really have to look at outcomes. Look at the actual uh, um, change that a patient's made in treatment. So, can uh, you identify the most effect effective therapist? So this is the experiment. Are you ready? Now, you've got to remember, this is going to be difficult because these are American therapists. So a little cross-cultural thing. Okay, I got everybody's attention. Here they are. Oh, they're not therapists. They're all-star baseball players. These are the best baseball players uh, in the major leagues in the United States. Uh, what do you notice about them? Just as, not as an athlete, uh, athletic expert or a baseball expert. Say it again. Yeah, they're dedicated. Okay, personality very well. I like that. Well, I'll give you some hints. Here is Ichiru Suzuki. Um, I, I show him because uh, he was the batting champion in Japan. And then he played for my, where I grew up, Seattle Mariners, and was the batting chapter, champion in the American uh, um, in major leagues in the United States. Look at his stance. Very different than this one. Look at the bat where they very high, relatively low. So Ichiro is the CBT therapist. Here's the psychodynamic therapist. Here's the emotion focused therapy. What's hot in Belgium right now? ACT is ACT. No EMDR therapists or batters here. So, oh, letting my bias show here. So what's important here to notice is that um, it's hard to observe just their performance because they have such different styles. Now, there are some commonalities if you know baseball, but they do so many different things. And what's interesting that um, uh, how often a baseball hitter in the major leagues get a hit is less than one out of three. So their NNT is less than three, or greater than three. So there's a lot of similarity in the statistics. You can go and see it true, and I've done this, and he doesn't get a hit. So you would say, he's not a very good hitter, if you were just to observe that one game. But over the long run, he's very skilled. So, what does not make a difference in therapist outcomes? We'll go through this uh, uh, quite quickly. Theoretical orientation, we've already been through that. So, you can't identify the most effective therapist by what they do. And that's true in naturalistic environments as well as um, uh, randomized clinical trials. Age, older therapists are not better. Personality, you would think we could identify. Um, uh, what are the personality characteristics? Jamie Delgadillo in the National Health Service data looked at the big five personality factors. No consistent uh, uh, results. Self-reported social skills don't predict. Uh, professional degree in the United States doesn't matter. Interviews of experts does not predict outcome. How do we hire therapists? In America, you get recommendations, you look at experience. I want to interview this person because I can tell who's going to be a good therapist. Absolutely no predictive ability. Okay. Experience, more experienced therapist. Actually, here's therapists over the course of their careers. 
they actually deteriorate. Okay. Yeah, not so, not so encouraging. So who are the best therapists? If you ask therapists, compare your clinical skills and performance to others, 25% uh, say they're in the top 10%. Everyone said they're below, uh, 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 below average. Everyone said they're above average. No one said they're below average. And none could identify failing cases. So the lesson here is you've got to measure outcomes to know if you're succeeding or not. Okay, so the last couple slides. What are the skills of effective therapist? So Tim Anderson did this really ingenious experiment. What he did is he had this whole uh, stable of therapists. He knew their outcomes. He knew who the best therapists were. And he said, well, I don't want to observe them because I know that's not going to work. I want them to see each see the same patient. Well, you can't do that, right? So what he does is he showed vignettes of difficult patients, had them respond, and then coded the response. Okay, And then he could identify from the coding of their video recorded responses who was the best therapist. Verbal fluency. These are the characteristics of effective therapists. They can express what they're saying in a clear, cogent, and persuasive manner. Okay, And that's kind of the competence. That's how we uh, persuade patients to believe we know what we're doing. We're explaining what we're going to do in therapy. Then there's the facilitative interpersonal skills along the warmth dimension, emotional perception, affective modulation, and expressiveness. How well can I read emotion, and how well can I express the emotion I want to express that's therapeutic? Warmth and acceptance, focus on the other. That's part of this feeling that the therapist is working in my best interest. And these are uh, uh, skills, interpersonal skills, which are exhibited in challenging situations. Okay, so he gave them really diff difficult vignettes. So if you look across the variables, again, this reiterates these relationship variables. And they're not just the warmth and caring, they're also the competence dimension. Okay, so the conclusion, psychotherapy works in multiple ways, the caring pathway, the expectancy pathways, and probably to some degree the specific pathways. But what's really important is therapists, 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 okay? And effective therapists have this sophisticated set of interpersonal skills that they demonstrate in the challenging uh, uh, interpersonal situations in psychotherapy. So, thank you. And that truly is about all I know about psychotherapy. <laughs> Perfect. Now we know it all. Thank you so much, Bruce, for an inspiring lecture. I'm not going to lose too much time. I'm going to invite our expert panel to have a seat. This is the mic. Let me... Okay, so I'm basically I'm going to ask you the really simple or not so simple question like what does it mean for you evidence-based psychotherapy? I'm not going to introduce you, so please briefly um, say who you are eh, and, uh, and maybe reflect a little bit together with us about, I know for, for one thing that not that many clinical psychologists read scientific peer-reviewed publications all the time. Eh? Many of them do not have the time or they do not even have access to, to, uh, to databases. So, and then the question is, how important is research for clinical practice? And is there a gap between researchers, between therapists, and how important is that? And what do we understand exactly if we say evidence-based psychotherapy? So let me 
give the floor to you first, so briefly present okay, yourself. Okay, thank you. I'm Carole Fontini, I'm professor at Université Libre de Bruxelles, I'm a clinical psychologist as well as psychotherapist. So, um, regarding your question, uh, is it necessary to have evidence-based research um, for clinical psychology? But the conference of uh, Bruce Wampole is just a little bit puzzling, but what it's clear is that technical skills and models are not so important than um, therapeutic alliance and the way you you gave your consultation and um, the way you synchronize with the patient and it's something that is not easily measurable. So uh, I personally, I'm a researcher, I think it's very important to have evidence-based practice to avoid curious psychotherapy and uh, something that could be deleterious for participants. But it, if technicals models or skills are not so important what is uh, has been demonstrated here that there is a specific effect as well regarding time so um, the um, a great question is how could we improve alliance how could we do that because there are some studies that show when you train uh, psychotherapists and psychologists to therapeutic alliance, the effects are worse. <laughs> so it's just a little bit intriguing. So what could we do with this? Mm -hmm. How could we improve warmth? I think that it's something that is root inside you and the way you, you share with your patient, um, I guess. Okay, let, let, let's keep it in our head for now, the therapeutic alliance. I, let's do a row first so we, we have everyone introduced. So Retzke, my colleague, uh, at Ghent University, um, we hear that theoretical models eh, are not that important. We should have known before because within our department there has always been some tensions between the CBTers and the psychoanalysis. So maybe, yeah, what about you? So introduce yourself and what do you think about evidence-based okay. psychotherapy? Well, that's a very broad question where I guess I could talk about for a few hours, but I will try to grasp some threads in my mind. So I'm Reetske Mingang, I'm a colleague of Alexis at the University of Ghent. Um, and I teach clinical psychology, but I'm from a psychoanalytic background and I also have a psychotherapeutic practice. Um, the theoretical models, well, I teach it to the students also that they don't find a difference. Um, indeed, there's much more therapist effects the question could be is the way we do research. Um, it doesn't mean because, that because we don't find average differences between psychotherapeutic orientations that the aims and the processes and the outcome are the same. If we measure symptoms, they might improve in the same way. Some people don't improve, some people do improve, but if we take another approach to research, we see that people have very different experiences and that some people, you talked about expectations, um, because they start from different expectations, don't align well with a certain therapeutic orientation. So there are differences, but it's, it's always a mix of, these very, of this very complex reality of the, the person of the therapist, which indeed, if that's the most important factor, difficult, how, to, um, how can we um, influence that? The patient with his way of looking at himself, at the world, and, and then the, the therapeutic model or the, the evidence that, uh, that is used. So um, I don't think there's a clear answer, but it's too easy to say that there is no difference. There's no general difference. But the question we could ask after these decades of research what we can still learn from that. We see that in practice didn't improve that people that it's not that more people are treated um, um, have better outcomes um, so and that questions that are crucial are not asked like therapist effects are very this very little research but i guess we'll come back to that later so maybe just i have a lot of other thoughts but maybe just one i think we also should, should consider that's my view on evidence-based practice that we maybe look at it in a very reductive way um, and that the, the reason that therapists don't consult um, 
evidence or empirical research is because it's simply not the type of knowledge that helps them to become better therapists or to learn. Because that's something that does um, um, is shown in research that therapists that are more effective are eager to learn and to keep learning throughout their career. But the, the type of knowledge they need is, is more uh, contextualized and clinically tangible knowledge that does not appear in uh, RCTs or in the, in the complex statistical analysis. So uh, they ask for process-based research that really shows them, not in a one-on-one -on -one way what I should do, but inspires them to think about their own practice. Just a few thoughts. Okay. We can come back to that. Thank you so much. We're going to listen to Professor Germes from Kaliev. Um, yes, hi. My name is uh, Ines Germes. I'm a psychologist by training and professor of contextual psychiatry at KU Leuven. Um, so I immediately want to challenge some ideas that have been uh, mentioned. So maybe first coming to, to your point. Um, so I, I definitely think that evidence and evidence-based practices are important uh, in psychotherapy. And that um, there is a 15-year gap between novel novelties being developed in research and before they reach practice. And I think you're actually giving a bit too much credit to the psychotherapists saying that they're all eager to learn and that it's, um, or the good ones. <laughs> um, Yes, uh, but so I do think that um, that it's really important to, to think about what kind of research we need. But I also do think that uh, people develop their expertise by following what is happening in research. And I think as psychotherapy, of course, is a very personal um, uh, process, um, that people sometimes tend to think that they know best what to do. And I find the example very interesting that actually psychotherapists become less efficient over time, showing that that reliance on experience is not enough, that you actually need to follow what is happening in order to keep an open mind and develop, keep developing your skills. So uh, in that sense, I think it is important and we need to find ways to close that gap and to bring research and, and, and practice closer together. Um, and then coming to your talk, um, I, I was interested in, in the last part of the psychotherapist. Um, and there's actually two things that I wanted to comment upon. First of all, I fully agree that we need to focus on outcomes. But the question, of course, is what are outcomes? What is a relevant outcome? And I think there is, we, we can have, uh, well, there's definitely has been a huge focus on reduction of symptoms, which probably for none of our patients is the, re the most relevant thing they're actually interested in. Um, so we need to uh, also from a research perspective think much more about what are relevant outcomes. Um, also, if you want to evaluate what is a good therapist, we need to know what outcomes we're looking at. Um, and the other uh, uh, comment that I wanted to make is uh, in relationship uh, or regarding the research you showed where you, the people were given the vignette. I think it's an interesting start, but it of course does not capture what is probably one of the most crucial things, which is indeed the, um, uh, the way people synchronize to one another, the way you, like, you, your, your motions, your, like, I think we need more science on what is actually a social interaction. For me, for example, we, it's focused a lot on social cognition, but that's just a very limited as aspect, and I, I actually believe that your social cognition results from the way you interact and from... So um, I thought it was an interesting start, but I think it only touches upon a very, well, like superficial uh, level of what is really the core. And so I think in that stage, there's much more work to do um, to try to really grasp what is that? What is that warmth? What is that? Why do people sometimes are perceived as such and why sometimes... So in that sense, 
I found it really an interesting um, uh, uh, this uh, an interesting uh, uh, comment, but um, or interesting research, but for me only the very very start of what we need to do. Okay, perfect. Let's listen to Elke van Hoof from uh, Vrije Universiteit Brussels. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, primary care psychologist, and alongside that, I have a private practice. Um, I do feel a lot for what Ines already said. I'm all f in favor of evidence-based psychotherapy. Uh, I think it's very necessary and we still have a long way to go to lure our uh, psychologists into the eagerness and willingness to learn, but also providing them the mandates and the, the necessary tools to do so. Yeah. Um, so for me, I am also in favor of outcome. Um, so I follow that uh, lead as well. But it's not just that we need more research on what, but also we need to reflect, are we ready to measure outcomes? As psychologists always emphasize the process rather than the outcomes. And we lack a bit of maturity to focus on outcomes. In my private practice, we focus on outcomes, we focus on functioning uh, in daily routines, what type of definition that is for the patient as well as return to work, the actual participation in daily life, uh, as well as reflectiveness. Eh? So there are some things, and I, my experience is psychologists who start working with us find that very, very scary. Every session is measured overall on satisfaction, and just the overall satisfaction with the session uh, the, the client and the psychologist. And if there is a score less than eight, you get a notification. But also, if there is a difference of two of more points between the client and the caregiver, you also get a notification. Mm. And it's just um, a push to reflect what is going on. Have you missed something? Because we're all eager to help out. And I think we not only have to study then the social interaction to see what are the elements that we then need to train our people on, but also increase maturity of being monitored, uh, not as a way to control, but as a way to progress and evolve and, and have a tool that can lead to more reflection. Mm -hmm. So uh, those were my two cents above everything else uh, for now. Okay, thank you so much. Bruce, do you want to reflect on any of these uh, issues? Well, you know the answer to that. <laughs> of course I, I never, do. <laughs> I never shy away from a question and giving my opinion, uh, even when I don't know the answer. But um, I'll say a few things. One is, well, education in particular treatments is really important. So my work shouldn't be interpreted that that's not important. We remember uh, competence dimension is around the belief, perceived belief, that this therapist has the competence to, and the design of the treatment to help me. And I can't have expectations for how I'm getting, going to uh, respond to this treatment if I don't understand what the treatment is. So it's very important for therapists to be trained in particular treatments and to administer them in a way that the patient will believe this is gonna be helpful. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, yeah, we are at the beginning of research really about psychotherapy and how it works. And I would encourage clinicians not to read the research because there's really um, not enough usable information there uh, to make it work. It's up to uh, um, the scientists and clinicians to work together to take the science and actually make it a, uh, a translation of how to get better. Okay, so that's maybe a little different about this science to practice idea that clinicians should be reading research. Mm -hmm. But I do, since we get to call this a debate, disagree about teaching the skills. 
So the facilitator of interpersonal skills can be taught. Now, is it all of psychotherapy? No. Is it most of it? I'm not sure. But every therapist needs to have a sophisticated set of facilitative interpersonal skills that they can call on at the moments they're needed in therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, with a motivated, uh, agreeable uh, uh, patient with a good attachment history, really easy to be empathic. We can all do it, okay? With a challenging interpersonal uh, uh, client, uh, patient, it can be extremely difficult to be empathic, and we have to train ourselves to be able to do it. So we know how experts are made, like baseball players, performing musicians, uh, football players, right? Um, sorry about the loss to the Swedish team, but uh, um, athletes use deliberate practice to get better. Anders Ericsson studied this over the course of his career, that what do experts do to continually improve? And we can use deliberate practice for these skills and others that we're going to uh, uh, come to identify to get better. So just the idea of being reflective, yeah, I think we should all be reflective. I think we should be eager to be learned, but we actually have to practice what we need to to get better. Mm. And let's start with those basic skills because that's what we know. And in the future, let's add to them. So, so how do you interpret then that finding that, because you could say more experienced uh, therapists had more practice. So, so how do you explain that finding? That's not practice, okay? <laughs> practice, deliberate practice is you practice a particular skill, not just a whole hour, right? You know, in supervision, what do we do? We give kind of general feedback. We talk about the patient. Do we ever, or we rarely say, look, you need to practice empathy with a, this type of patient who's being uh, challenging to you. I got a great videotape of an expert therapist uh, being challenged by a, a patient with borderline features, and he just blows it completely. Didn't express empathy at all about um, this particular patient. So let's, let's practice in a controlled environment this particular skill over and over again with feedback. The practice we get, even if you have the outcomes, right? So, hey, I'm not succeeding with this particular patient. I don't know what to do differently. Nobody's watched it and said, here's the skill, here's the error you made, let's correct it and do it differently. So it's the identification and practice of particular skills outside of practice. I wanted to add to that because indeed in how we organized it, uh, you get a score and if you have a, a, yeah, a lower score of three times in a row, you have to respond. You have to come with a strategy. You have to go and analyze the files. What happened? What, what, what did you do? Why did you do that? Uh, but also on the interaction, uh, more than on the intervention. Uh, and so, yes, indeed, eh, you, you practice the responsiveness, the how you resonate, but also how persuasive were you to bring uh, your uh, client, your patient, into the interaction, uh, and it actually works. Eh? It, it works really well, and you have it from the, the perspective of the patient, but also your own perspective. And, and what you also, uh, you are able to identify the best clients, but also your worst nightmares. It's quite easy, but also your own patterns, eh? because we all do also have blind spots. Eh? Uh, also our, our uh, psychologists who tend to score them always lower than the patient, that's also a pattern that I want them to analyze and look at. Why is that? Because then there is an insecurity in your interpersonal styles uh, and, and you should address that also. So I, I am also in favor of outcome and then the, the, the process, but yeah, to test those interpersonal resonation things mm. 
that I not have not sufficient words as we do not have sufficient signs. But I can tell you from practice that this really works. At first it's really scary, but at the end it's quite interesting uh, to have those uh, points of evaluation to look at. Okay, let, let, let's hear the audience maybe. What, what do you think? I know that we have a lot of... Re who is a researcher in the, in the room? Who is a, who is a therapist? Okay, that's a major part of the audience. Anyone who wants to react or want to ask a question? Yes, uh, I'll come. Um, maybe a, um, a question, I want to say something about the importance of personal work, because I fully agree with the importance of the therapist factor. And, um, um, but what do we do with this, this finding uh, that the therapist makes all the difference in, in the treatment? Uh, I have a bit of difficulties to follow the, the metaphor of, of the sports, like, like therapy as a performance, and that you can separate the skills into, uh, and train them separately, uh, separate skills. To what degree should we actually consider the person as, of the therapist itself? Uh, and and a, a requirement of him uh, or her doing some personal work uh, and, and the contribution of that uh, to, to, to in, the, in the therapy process and outcome also. Well, um, again, we get to call this a debate. Um, yes, I think personal work by the therapist is important. But in our field, we, in my opinion, uh, uh, too, uh, too much em emphasize that aspect. And I'm going to give you one example. So I was doing supervision of a woman uh, treating a very difficult patient. And she was describing the difficulty. And I said, no, I want to know what happens in the interaction. She gave the interaction. This was group supervision. It was clear she made a therapeutic error. What she said to the patient was uh, clearly perceived to be critical of the patient rather than empathic and understanding. So everybody had this realization, including the therapist. And the shame came over her face that something wrong with me. And I just stopped her and I said, no, this is a really difficult patient. We need to practice being empathic. All therapists would find this difficult. It isn't around your own personal psychology. This is a skill you can learn. And it was such a relief to her. So too often we ascribe ineffectiveness or, or difficulty to the personality or the mental health or the insight that the therapist has. And I would say, okay, let's come to that after we've done the basic skills. Let's practice that particular skill and see if you can do it the next time you're with her without sending that person to analysis because why should they have such a uh, uh, counter-transference reaction with this patient. So, my opinion. Yes, but I don't fully agree because uh, in, is, if this thing happens uh, time after time, the shame hindering your own reflective process, yeah, then it should be addressed. And I do uh, feel uh, that we also need to address, but in a correct way, our own process. Uh, and that we should emphasize how important that is. So for me, it's an end, end story and not first uh, the interaction and then the other. But I do feel that this also touches upon a delicate point is you cannot hold anybody responsible for something they haven't learned yet. And I think we lack in our, in our education to become a clinical psychologist the skill, the interpersonal practice skill. We don't do that. So we cannot hold our people responsible for not being good at it. And if we taught it, then it would be different. And I would emphasize more the, the own process. Uh, but now I feel eh, what you say, yeah, you cannot hold anybody responsible for the thing they haven't learned yet, so you need to learn it yet. But that's a flaw in our educational system, that our educational system is too theoretical. 
and not in practice. And for me, that is actually a consequence of the fact that lots of our professors don't know how real life works, how difficult patients are outside the laboratory and experiments. And for me, that is also something we definitely, as fast as possible, need to address. Yeah, I, I agree that um, it's an and and story. Um, and I also don't think that we can underestimate the importance of personal work, whatever shape it takes, because um, the blind spots you were referring to, it's what we can hear, what, as you said, it's important, the, the, enduring, the uniquely enduring quality of a psychotherapeutic relationship is only possible if we can really hear everything that a patient comes with. And to be able to hear, that requires a lot of personal work because it's not the, you cannot hear what you cannot see or address in yourself. So um, it's, it's a precondition. I think it's a necessary work for every psychotherapist, which doesn't preclude that it's important to learn skills and to be, to be aware that it's not all your responsibility and that every difficulty that appears in psychotherapy is because your own counter-transference. Carol, do you want to, you want to add something? Sorry, yes, ah, okay, okay. Yes, I'll come to you with the mic. I would like to ask a question. How would you uh, translate this? Because I, because you're always talking about a, a, a therapist and a patient. I'm a family therapist. Sometimes you have much more uh, members of, of uh, yeah, much more patients in, in the room. Uh, also, with group theory treatment, uh, multiple family treatment. I did some research and. Uh, patients, uh, depressed patients, they uh, recovered just by copying and modeling behavior of another patient. So treatment of yeah, the therapist wasn't that important. So can you reflect on that? Uh, what you have to, yeah, with, what skill, uh, skills do you need? And if there are more than one patient uh, in group treatment, multiple family therapy treatment, and how you, what's the, uh, what can a therapist do then? Yeah. Okay, someone who wants to react on that? What about family therapy? How do you manage that? Well, the, the, the individual therapy is not the only modality. We know group therapy is probably as effective for most disorders as is individual therapy. And we have family therapy. Um, it's interesting in the United States, and, uh, you get paid for individual therapy but not group therapy, so there is some, some kind of uh, systemic problems. But the skills are different, right? They're similar, but they're particular skills for marriage and family therapy, managing the alliance not only with each individual, but the alliance among the family members, for instance. Group therapy, the modeling, and the, the uh, group process. So, yes, but I think, again, Let's try to break this down to the skills that need to be learned so that students feel like, well, I understand what I need to learn to be an effective therapist. And it isn't this ambiguous process that I went through in training as a therapist. Uh, this kind of, uh, well, you just go in there and do this therapy. And then we have this supervision that isn't focused on any particular skill. And I go home wondering, what is it I'm really supposed to be doing? I guess it's the pragmatic part of me that makes it, I want to know what it is I need to learn. So we're talking about the deliberate practice, and I think we agree on this. Mm -hmm. One thing Anders Ericsson says, you need a coach. You need someone to help you analyze what it is you need to practice. So Rafael Nadal, best tennis player in the world, well, he has a coach not as near as good at tennis, but really good at identifying the skills to learn. Yeah. Yes, and I wanted to also refer again to uh, emphasize my case. As we do not teach interpersonal skills at university, there is even less done for group skills. And it is in legislation that primary care psychologists need to organize group sessions but nobody 
has been taught what needs to be done there. And at university, that is not taught. Because indeed, what you do, eh, you, uh, as a, you are not an individual in a group. You are the leverage. And it's something different that you do uh, to keep up the pace, to align, to make everybody resonate. And even there, there is fewer signs. But at university, no one who's teaching that to our future psychologists. And so I think we are, and that part I, I fully agree, we are touching upon something that we need to address as soon as possible. Uh, if we want to progress and still answer to the needs of the people who seek us. Okay, we have two more questions here. It's answered? Okay, then I have another one over there. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to ask a question about, because you, the conclusion is quite strong that theoretical models don't, don't matter, huh? Uh, and I understand that it is based on meta-analysis, but we also know that meta-analysis, the quality of the outcome of a meta-analysis is also dependent on the quality of the studies included. Huh? Uh, so that's one, one thing. And the second thing is also, it has already been touched a bit, um, it depends also probably on the outcome measures that in, uh, are included and are analyzed. Huh? Um, like, is it symptom reduction or daily life functioning? And then also, I think it was broadly about uh, depression, anxiety kind of uh, uh, problems, but we, we have other problems as well. Huh? For example, if I think about autism spectrum disorder, I think then it does matter which uh, approach uh, people choose. So I, I agree in general with the, with the, the, the conclusion, but I think it's, it's, it's a bit strong um, because, yeah, because of these reasons, but I would like to hear your uh, opinion. Well, the outcome measure question uh, is an important one, and I agree with the comment that, that patients don't come. I want the removal of this particular symptom, and it does upset me that more and more clinical trials are focused only on uh, the diagnostic outcome for that particular disorder. So well-being, quality of life, I think absolutely should be included in the uh, uh, assessments. And again, if you get to something more specific like autism, well, the outcomes there can be very specific. Uh, there's a woman in England that lets the patients choose what outcome measures most relevant for them, which is an interesting idea. I think we have to be careful about the general conclusion that all treatments for all disorders are uh, equally effective and qualified by the ones we've studied. OCD is one. Autism clearly is, is different. We might have a debate about which is the best treatment, but clearly it's different than treating uh, uh, anxiety and depression. In general practice, uh, anxiety and depression are 85, 90% of of the disorders put in personality disorders for which there's no differences and, and we're close to the whole universe. But that doesn't say we can just do that across disorders without paying attention to the particular disorder. I think another thing that is important in this relation uh, or in this association is um, that so we, we don't really know what makes a good therapist, but we also don't really know what are the actual working components of a therapy. And so I think now we, we hide. If you look at research, it's, it's, there is, there is some, some work on that, but um, I think actually a lot of these, we need to focus on, on working components on what processes actually work in therapy and probably they don't work for everyone. That is also individually different. Um, but of course, this is in, um, in a clinical trial, also all just mixed together. People get the treatment or not, but we don't really focus on which specific elements of the treatment, which specific processes did we target. And so I think also uh, that is where we need more work. 
Um, and probably lots of these processes are transdiagnostic. They're, it, is, it is not so relevant for, because it's similar across, uh, similar kind of problems across different disorders. And so I, I would say that that is another way that we need to improve. We need to identify better what are working elements and without sort of putting them all together in a box and say, this is CBT, this is another therapy, this is ACT, this is, it's about what working elements in these. I also had some thoughts on your, on your question that about the equal outcomes. Um, and the, the, the matter of outcome in general, because I think it's a bit the elephant in the room that measuring outcome is very, very difficult. So if we focus on outcome, that's the first question. Also, the equal outcomes, we did a lot of qualitative research within the context of, an, of RCT, so uh, where we have the quantitative outcomes and then the qualitative. And they are, first of all, they are not, this, they are not the same. People experience different kinds of change, which can um, equally help them in their lives and, and with functioning and, and with how and their well-being can be similar, but the way they experience therapy and what might have worked and, and the things that changed in their lives can be quite different. But also that people that are categorized as good outcome, um, not changed or bad outcome, if you talk to them and try to um, grasp what that therapy did and what the change is, within those groups there is a lot of heterogeneity. So um, there is no straightforward answer, but the therapies, they are not the same and the outcomes are not the same. But it's much more difficult than saying, so there is a general difference between therapies in their effectiveness for specific diagnosis. There, there are some. There are some diagnoses. I, I don't think we will go into the... But, for example, for depression, I guess the equal outcomes are very, very well known. But also there, there are no equal outcomes for specific individuals. And it's, um, we can learn a lot from, from that variety within groups. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Yes, okay. Um, I'm working as a systemic therapist, and we started with loneliness, we started with social vaccination, with social fever, and what, what strikes me is that in, in talking about outcomes, it, it sounds a little bit as if that aspect isn't taken into account or something. So I, I was wondering while you were talking, how come we don't take loneliness as one of the yeah, measuring th items um, to, to ask people uh, after or, or in, in, in course of therapy? So that, yeah, yeah. It, it, the, there's both a kind of surface level to this and a deeper level. At the surface level, um, I've helped different organizations to, um, uh, uh, design outcome measures, and I always encourage them to measure loneliness. I think it's absolutely important. You know, the, this information is, is useful to the therapist. It's not just, am I successful or not? But this provides me information. Someone can be less depressed um, uh, or less socially anxious, but still lonely. And then we haven't succeeded. So loneliness absolutely should be measured. But you really raise a more profound point, and that is, these are all individual measures. We're measuring individuals not systems. So Bill Pinsoff developed a measure, the stick. Uh, uh, I forget what it stands for, but it, it measures not only individual functioning, but the functioning of the family and the social organization. So it's a really an important point. It's a very Western idea that we treat individuals absent their um, systemic kind of context. So it's, important point to make, particularly at the end here. 
Um, I uh, agree with that, and uh, maybe yeah, one thing that that we're trying to implement, also as an outcome measure, is t things like experience sampling or ecological momentary assessment, so that actually people uh, track themselves in their daily lives, where you can actually look at the variety of things. So it's also about yeah, how active are you, but also what is the quality of your social relationships? How do you feel when you're with others? How do you interact? Uh, do you feel you belong, that you feel safe? So it's also, I think, um, and so um, I think it's also important to look at all these different aspects and it's a much richer picture. Um, so it would be very helpful if we, uh, yeah, uh, use that kind of methodology just to compare before and after treatment and see where are the differences and where did we achieve and where are still some and so yeah just wanted to add yeah and i also want to to add eh, if you look at positive psychology we look at thriving uh, the sense of belonging is there a very important outcome um, i wanted to add also it's uh, also true that if you reduce anxiety and you, you reduce depression, what you tend to see is that the social interaction and the social responsiveness improves and that people go and seek out others more than before and increase their, their social, uh, uh, yeah, social network, improving or even enhancing their uh, reduction of anxiety and depression. So you have like a, a very, ex yeah, exponential uh, effect on there and it's even in my area of return to work where you see that if you can treat the the sense of belonging that people return earlier to work even while still symptomatic but they feel stable they feel safe and they feel that as a group they can deal with this and so the social uh, skills it's not just on the individual I think but it's foremost to go out and interact and to have that social brain uh, active again. So I think uh, also there, there is a lot more than we now perceive as we all tend to name it something else. Uh, you have the, the mastery in the thriving, you have the sense of belonging, uh, you have the social interaction. So it's, it's a, I think there is a lot of research available on that, but it's so fragmented because we have really cut down to the to the building blocks or try to that we lose this whole scope. So I, there, I feel quite confident that there is already quite some some things that are uh, available. But I I think we all agree that it's a very important point, as if it it might be the most important point uh, for psychotherapy, of course, as outcome. I have, uh, yeah, okay. So um, I just want to, to uh, agree with what you are talking about, that sometimes patient comes to see us and have their own expectancy regarding outcome, and usually it's about uh, decreasing symptoms. And at this stage, it's really, really important to um, propose education about our own model, how we work regarding this outcome as personally, I usually use acceptance and commitment therapy. The outcome is not decreasing uh, symptoms. It's rather improving social functioning, improving the contact with the values of patients. And by working on these ingredients, usually we see that symptoms decrease because um, we need to, uh, don't forget that patients are usually convinced that if they are not less anxious, they couldn't do nothing. And I think it's important to reverse also this perspective and showing them that if you, um, if you are more in contact with what is important to you and if you could engage with your anxiety, with your sadness, you could do things and usually things improve also. So it's depending on what we are considering about treatment outcome, what is that? Exactly. I'm totally convinced it's not a question just of symptoms, but it's normal. Patient one found comes to see us, I just would like to be no more anxious, no more depressed, which is not always possible because in life, usually we experience anxiety or sadness. And I think it's really, really important to... Um, 
to think about uh, all of the ingredients that are going to have consequences and positive consequences of symptomatology. Okay, thank you. I, I have here a question. Hi, uh, my name is Julie. I'm a, I'm a family therapist and a researcher as well. Uh, I agree and disagree with, with some points I found it very interesting until now. Um, I was, so I, I think what I do agree on is, is indeed that one of the outcomes should be definitely how our clients can connect to their own social network. I think um, we as therapists, therefore it's needed that we can connect to our clients. And what I do also agree on is that in order to connect to our clients, we need to connect to ourselves and there we need personal work. Um, I think we learn a lot uh, on that uh, during, I, I did my family therapy course in Leuven. I, I think there it's, it's very integrated in, in that course. Um, I, but what I do still miss, and, I, and that's what, what my question would be to, to all of you, is so what I do still miss in, in the course of psychology and, and, and as a therapist, um, where we are closing the gap between the research and the therapy. And I think we, we have not found any answers yet, uh, or I didn't hear them, I think. But yeah, I'm just wondering what are you, your ideas on, on that? How can we close that gap maybe early on during in the stage of, of getting the education as a psychologist and a therapist? Thank you so much. Maybe that's a good uh, question to round up the session and then a very important one. So think carefully. Okay. <laughs> well, one way I see um, to bridge the gap, because I do think it's very important that we bridge that gap and that clinicians see some usefulness in, in reading research is, is going back to how do we actually learn and how do, we, how do people evolve from a novice therapist to an expert therapist and the learning process from novice to expert in all disciplines is, well, research shows that it's not uh, goes through formal rule-based learning, like if you have this diagnosis, you should do that, but it goes through case-based learning. That's how we learn. And I think the, the challenges to translate or research or use in, in addition to learning skills, like uh, case-based learning, we need more research that um, uses the case level to show the things we learn from research, uh, in case-based research that shows really very specifically how things can work within the interaction. And that is something that research, um, therapists can relate to and learn from that um, gives rise to reflection on their own work. Um, it doesn't provide them with um, a one-on-one -on -one answer what they should do but it can facilitate a learning process. And uh, we can learn by hearing from a trusted other. We can learn vicariously. <laughs> um, so that's also a way to learn by reading and discussing um, cases from other therapists where things are shown that, are, that we have learned to be important. So I think that is one way that we can address that gap and facilitate the transfer from research to clinical practice. Um, I also think that um, within research, what we're really lacking is implementation research. So we often stop when we do our clinical trial and we say, okay, there is evidence, but then that is in a very a specific uh, uh, controlled uh, situation. And so I think we need to invest much more in implementation research, really trying to understand how do we get these things that we find in research, how can that be implemented, how do we have to do that, what is needed in different circumstances. And so I, in, in that sense, I think there is a responsibility on both sides. And uh, as researchers, we cannot just say, oh, the therapists don't read our research. No, we also need to um, study, actually, uh, how it can be implemented, what is needed. And so rather than developing more and more new therapies, and now with the digital era, 
it's even more, and I'm also guilty of that. I'm also developing new therapies. But I think we also need to take the responsibility to take the next steps and not just develop things, study things, but then also take the steps of how to get that to the clinic, how to get that to therapists, and what is needed for that. So I think in that sense, uh, research and, and researchers have to take the responsibility as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I agree. I have to say I agree with both of my colleagues. Um, but I am a clinician. Eh? I am much more in time a clinician than a professor. And that for me, eh, I'm very pragmatic. So I would suggest, as I am a pragmatic a quota on clinical professors and not just have research professors. As for me, being a professor, a research professor and a clinician is, is making me the best I can be. Because being very close in proximity with my research professors, whom tend to be incredibly critical to what I'm saying, what I put out there, what I'm doing, makes me the best version as a clinician. But having me voicing out why I choose to do it differently than it's written in the papers helps them perform better in research. So, you, yes, you can have cases, and yes, you can as a research professor, discuss cases, uh, cases with your students. But I am convinced, and I have none no, whatsoever, no science to back that up, but I'm convinced that we have to bring those both worlds into our university walls where it is safe, where we can voice and debate. And sometimes, I can really tell you, it's sometimes there are very critical debates, and that's what makes me better as a clinician, but improves their research skills as well. So that's why I would state we need a quota on more clinical professors. Uh, and also there, there is some work to be done. Okay. Thank you. I fully agree with you. Uh, personally, I'm a full professor at university, but I kept a clinical activity because it's just impossible for me to translate something real, uh, roots in practice to students. So I think that a solution is probably to um, have more researcher as well as clinicians to, to better uh, teach our, um, our student, I guess. And it's sometimes very complica complicated for us because our colleagues that are only researcher as have a, a curious uh, regards on what we've done clearly and uh, I, I could I could understand but there are also a clinical reality and the clinical reality is not on the books that's clear because often I ask my student okay you have books you are very nice case study but in reality it's not like that clearly it's more complicated more subtle and more nuanced so it's for me it's clearly important to have this clinical practice. So I totally agree with you. Yeah, and what is, is I think the, the, the clinicians and the researchers, they have a lot in common. Both are very curious, both are very eager, both are very committed, so there is a common ground that you can immediately build upon to then yeah, co-create and, and make it better than it is today. And I think if we keep it separate, we will never be able to uh, answer those very complicated questions that we are now driven and forced to start responding. Yeah, well, I, I'll just add one comment. We often think of clinicians as being inattentive to the evidence, and so the responsibility somehow is on the clinician to read our evidence and improve. Well, the fact of the matter is um, the problem is the research. It doesn't really strong enough to be actionable in most cases. There are some exceptions. Tim Anderson's work on what makes effective therapists, I think, is something that is actionable and 
is being implemented. But most of what we produce is absolutely useless. Um, and I will say this kind of strongly, useless to the clinician, but useless in terms of the research. There's absolutely no really uh, uh, deepening of our understanding of the phenomenon and what will make it better. Okay, it's, yeah, it's good to, yeah, to have Ritzka because we cannot end yeah. with someone saying that the research, research is completely useless, the doctoral <laughs> schools will not be happy. Almost. 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 I, I, will not, I will not disagree, however. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to add that we, that we should, as you said, the, um, it's not, there's, the, it's like the researchers are somewhere there and the, the clinicians are researchers and I think it's time we acknowledge that again. They are working every day and they are learning every day and they are trying to grasp what is happening. And saying that is not research is, is discarding our whole foundation because that's where all our theories come from. They, are, they originate in clinical practice and thinking that we can put something on clinical practice starting in the laboratory without um, having contact or connect to real clinical practice, that's an illusion. So. That's also a way to produce knowledge, and that's why I also feel that research that is really that starts from that interaction, clinicians and researchers, is much more fruitful. So um, there's well, okay. There's hope. There's hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will I will send the panel uh, panel members home with an intervention that is proven effective. It's called Belgian chocolate, so it will make it will surely make you more happy.